Greetings and welcome to another episode of Maisha Kazini, where we have some conversations with people who are thinking and writing about different aspects of our lives. Uh, today we are honored to, to be talking with Babu Ayindo, who is a storyteller and a peace uh, expert and was part of a team that wrote an excellent report called In Search of Healers, a study on cycles of violence, collective trauma, and strategies for healing and peace building in Kenya. So Karibu Babu Ayindo. Dante. Uh, maybe we can start with, uh, you know, telling us who you are and, yeah, and, and your, your build up to this report that you have written. Yeah. Um, yes, I was, uh, I was born in this uh, city of Nairobi. So I grew up here most of uh, my early life. Uh, but I also spent quite a bit of time in... Uh, Uranga in East Game, uh, Siaya County, with my grandparents. Um, I was told that earlier on, my father had to move to Nairobi, you know, in search of, you know, jobs and things like this. Mm. So I remained there in my early life with my grandparents, hence my very strong attachment to my late grandmother, uh, Josefina Ongecha Nyotenda, who was a storyteller and a dancer. And also my grandfather, uh, the late uh, Boaz uh, Odera Ogwande, who also was a storyteller, but different, kind of, different kinds of stories uh, I, I, you know, I heard and shared uh, with him. So my formal education basically was in Nairobi, uh, in Nairobi Islands, in Botella, uh, all the way going to Nairobi Technical for high school, ended up at Queen of Apostles uh, Junior Seminary for A level, ended up at KU in the School of Education, uh, taught a little bit uh, for a short period in uh, Moranga, and then um, came back to KU and I was doing other stuff with People for Peace in Africa, um, landed a scholarship uh, in Peace and Conflict Studies, so I went to the US uh, in Virginia at Eastern Mennonite. On my return, I worked with the People for Peace for a while and Amani People's Theater, and then there's so much mm. in between work in social change, uh, teaching, uh, doing a bit of research. And then to bring it closer uh, to the report, I had just spent four years uh, teaching at the Doug Hammarskjöld uh, Peace Center in Zambia. And I came back to Kenya in December of 2004. And it was a very different, it was a very different country. Things were happening that I didn't quite understand. I'd been away for four years. Um, and I decided to settle in Kisumu. Uh, this was a whole negotiation that involved, you know, my spouse and children because we visited Mombasa. Uh, you know, we came back to Nairobi. Nobody liked Nairobi. Uh, we ended up in Kisumu by chance, and we kind of liked Kisumu. And I also wanted to be near my parents at the time. So 2007 and 8 happened when I was living at Tomboya Estate in Kisumu. This is a stone's throw, uh, to use that phrase, from Kondele, where so much was happening. So you can imagine uh, coming back from Zambia, being involved in some of the community-based peace work, and then the election of 2007, and uh, eight happens. And just to put a footnote here, in 2002, I was actually in Zambia and I advocated and I pushed, uh, uh, my wife was not very interested in for us coming back for the elections in 2002. And I said, you know, this is a historical moment. Mm. I am, Bella. I don't want to read about it. I don't want mm. to be told, I got to be there. And, you know, people of my generation had a very interesting history with the Moi regime. Mm. So for the promise that there was possibility now that we'll have a new regime was a historical moment I could not miss. So I found my way back here with the family to just witness. And I was at Uhuru Park when Kibaki uh, was, you know, was sworn in. So those were some of the 
questions and dilemmas in 2007. Just what happened? I mm. also need to say, Mwalimu, that I had been part of a whole uh, movement of peace builders who had been doing a lot of valuable community-based work, including parts of Rift Valley that were severely hit by the violence. So for us, it was a really turning point, asking ourselves, what did we get wrong in our theory and in our practice? Mm -hmm. How could we in our country? So when the Coalition for Peace in Africa asked me then to be part of the team to, to develop the design and do this study, I just said, even for my own personal you know, learning, yeah. and uh, I just need to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And, and um, before we get to the report, could you say something about your storytelling, that, that side of your life? Uh, how much storytelling do you do? Uh, what brings you into storytelling and what is the importance of storytelling? Oh, that's a good one. Like I mentioned earlier, my grandmother told a lot of stories, mm. but her stories were the stories of the animals. Yeah. The the, you know, the, 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 the leper did this and so on and so forth. So, you know, as grandchildren, you sometimes don't quite get the, the importance of a certain story at a certain age. I also know that my grandfather was more focused on stories of who we are as a people and as a clan, uh, where we've come from, the migration history, the feats you know, we've gone through as a people. Um, and of course, part of it, of course, uh, you know, uh, as a man, uh, what is about self-congratulation? He would congratulate himself on the things he has done. He used to be a house builder, so he traveled a lot, you know, in, uh, in what we call the Western part of Kenya and other parts, you know. So he traveled a lot. So he would come back and he would come back with stories. And I listened to these stories. Uh, so for my grandfather's beat was the question of documenting some of the stories at a very early age. And the documentation came through letter writing. My grandfather did not go to a formal school. So mm -hmm. because he, me, he relied on me to do his letters. So when letters came through the postal box uh, or he needed to reply, I was there to sit down with him and, and write these stories. And I began seeing the importance of storytelling because even at a young age, I began kind of editing some of the stories so that the message would remain, uh, you know, but cutting down on certain details. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with my grandmother. So many of the stories my grandmother told me, some of which by the way I've documented, I've written them up. Um, they were about educating us as young people about what to do and what not to do. Um, and you know, certain lessons that even at that age as an adolescent, I couldn't quite understand. So in my, in my practice as a peace builder, I have stolen those stories because they were so rich uh, in the way they talked about issues of peace and fairness and equality and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And before I joined Kenyatta University, I, I had worked a lot with Chelepe Arts. Uh, Chelepe Arts uh, is, is an arts-based group at the Our Lady of Visitation Church in the Eastlands in Makadara. And that's where, you know, I really began kind of practicing what you might call the stage performance and storytelling. So if you know, if you know of the late uh, Maura Bantu mm -hmm. uh, in Chelepe yeah. Arts, and really experimenting with some of the ideas about you know, storytelling. Uh, later on, uh, with the support of uh, the late Father Carol Hull, uh, who had seen some of the work we were doing, he said, look, Babu, some of the work you are doing, you could do it within the framework of the parishes of the Catholic Church. And we thought, well, yeah, actually we could do some of those storytelling within churches. So Father Carol influenced other priests to be allowing us instead of the priest giving a long homily, that after they read the biblical verse, we would come in and perform a short story. And this would be something closely related either to the gospel of the day, or it could be a contemporary issue. 
about peace and justice. And that's really how uh, Bantu Maura and myself and a couple of other people, uh, Philomena Waidera, uh, Oliver Mbai, Fred Kibunja, Dono mm -hmm. uh, and others, came together and said, let's form a group which will not only focus on the biblical stories, but also begin engaging with some of the peace and justice issues of the day. Mm -hmm. so, telling for us became kind of a safe way, if you can, I can put it that way, of engaging with certain issues. Because you know what was happening in the 80s and part of the 90s. Yeah. Uh, we knew that plays were being banned. Um, uh, of course, we performed a little bit at the Goethe Institute and other places, but it was also risky. Um, I remember one time we were preparing for a performance at Goethe Institute, and we were told that we needed to take our place for, uh, they were calling it for an approval. Um, uh, you take the script somewhere in your house and somebody would read it and would grant you a permit for a public performance. But from what we had heard at the time, we knew this was a very risky venture. We talked to a, a number of people who had been to their house and we said, no way. Mm. We still couldn't avoid it because we were performing in a public space. So we had to learn to do storytelling in a way we could say things without saying. In a way, even if somebody came in and sat and said, but you are talking about this particular issue in society, we would say, no, we were just telling the story. Telling a story. And, they, and so on and so forth. Mm. But for grandmother, this remains with people. Malimu, stories remain with people. Mm -hmm. I, I am always fascinated. I meet people I've worked with in South Sudan years later, even a decade later. They have forgotten all the long lectures I gave about defining peace and defining justice. As soon as I meet them, they say, Babu, I disagree with that part of the story of the lion. The lion shouldn't have done that. Mm. And that has been the beauty of engaging through storytelling. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I, I, it's so funny that I'm, I'm now beginning to appreciate more. I, I think I knew it from an academic point of view. But now I'm beginning to emotionally connect with stories. Um, so um, I wanted to ask this um, as we get into your report. And for the sake of the viewers, I'm going to share the link uh, below this video. Um, how do you respond to this idea that is very rampant in Kenya, that our emotions don't matter because I saw you mention it, it's mentioned in the report that our emotions don't matter. What matters is getting development, uh, poverty, ignorance, and disease, you know. So that formula does not include our emotional life and our social life. So how do you respond to that? You know, it's, it's a difficult question, Malimo, and it's a struggle uh, I've always had, especially when I'm engaging in high level political processes. Um, my, my hypothesis has been, well, we are living in a, in a world where, you know, it is defined by the, you know, the coloniality of power. Mm. For those of us who have gone through the, you know, the academy, there's always the kind of the privileging of, you know, be rational about this, uh, you know, uh, Babu don't be emotional about this. And I sometimes wonder where this division or the dichotomy comes from, where we, we begin feeling like it is normal not to express emotion. Particularly, I think in patriarchal uh, societies, uh, like many of our uh, uh, nations in this country, um, there's a sense in which because our power structures and systems are dominated by men and we are raised in such a way as to emphasize, you know, we've got to be rational. The emotions don't matter. Um, it's hurting us. Uh, mm -hmm. In my, my research, Malim, one of the most kind of uh, astounding things I experienced when I moved around uh, this was just after the post-election violence in 2007 and 8. 
was the manner in which people talk about emotions in present tense. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I was in uh, Wagala, I was in Wajia. So, you know, uh, we landed in Wajia, I was interviewing a few people. And then I needed to go to the Wagala airfield. And there's this young guy, a taxi driver, who took me there. Uh, it's a bit of a distance. Uh, and then there's a roadblock there. We have our Kenya military, I think, or GSU. And then you negotiate your way. And then I went to the airfield. And when I was in the airfield with him, he recounted what happened. And so, you know, we would be walking and he would be telling me, I wanted to pick some stones just for my own um, kind of remembrance. Mm -hmm. And he told me not those rocks there because those were placed by the community. Uh, and it, it is a part of their way of coming to terms with those emotions. So he took me through, um, we came back to the vehicle and we were heading back to Ajia. And that's when it kind of struck me. I looked at him and I thought, there is no way this guy would have been there in 1984. He was too young. And so I asked him, you know, uh, you've told me the stories about we were here. This happened to us. Uh, the men were stabbed. We were in the sun for hours. And then one day we say enough is enough. And we ran towards the fence. And then they shot at us. And uh, he said, no, he was not there, of course. He was born much later. But this story has been told over and over again. And you can imagine it is told with the emotion. Um, and even for a person who was not there, kind of the emotion is, is uh, becomes even greater through the story. This is now the, the power of storytelling mm -hmm. because pages are formed, the emotion and so on and so forth. So for people who say the emotions don't matter, um, we are losing a very critical piece in how we theorize and how we practice our efforts to break cycles of violence in a community or in a, in a society. And uh, just to give you another example, I spent about three months living in a small village in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. This was part of my doctoral research. So I would accompany the community. I would be present there when they were singing their songs. And there is a way the Maori people sing certain songs, which is very different from the way uh, a typical you know, African would sing, almost in what we call four-part harmony. So there was a sense in which they were singing certain songs almost flat. So it will go ta -ra 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 -ra. So for me, I'd not been used to that. I, I needed to hear, and you know, as an artist storyteller, you want to hear those different parts of the voices. So I asked, I said, how come these songs are sung this way and these ones are sung that way? And there was one person in the community, uh, you know, a woman who was a leader and a guardian participating in those songs. And she told me, this is the way our ancestors told us to sing these particular songs. And the idea was, these are the songs that tell the stories of how we suffered during colonialism and the British, the, the destruction and the rape and the killing and, and so on and so forth. And our ancestors were very keen that when we sing these songs, we should make sure that we pass the message but not the, the emotion that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so, so deep. If you, if you create all those different voices, they will also get the emotion. Just to give you an example, Malimu, I don't know whether, if you ever visited South Africa and attended the, any gathering, I was there during the election, first election of Zuma. And I remember observing, we were part of a civil society observer mission, something, something. So you go to this political gathering. And as soon as the former president Jacob Zuma began a certain song, and for example, he loved the song, um wa mi, um wa mi, laulezo, um wa mi, which basically says, bring me my shotgun. 
Now, if you sing that kind of song in South Africa of 2017 or 16, you not only bring back the message, you also bring back the emotion. emotion. They become very raw. And mm -hmm. I think to some degree, I've seen that also in Kenya during election time. There are certain yeah. songs I hear, and I know that the intention here is not about the message of celebrating our history as a people and so on. Mm -hmm. Is a politician who wants to make sure the, the wound is peeled and the emotion <laughs> is sort mm. of use it then for their political project. Actually, my students told me that and I had never thought about it. They said that because I, I was asking, why are we still always voting in the same way? And that's what they said. They said, because when the politicians come, they come and bring back all those old wounds as if they are fresh. And then people just go over them again. And so they don't hear anything else. I mean, they're not able to ask any other questions of the politicians because they are back into those emotions of that time. Yes, Lee. Wow. Eh. Okay, and, and there was something I forgot to tell you before we started that I hope, because we are talking about something very heavy, that at the end you will say a blessing for us or something or a story that will sort of leave us uh, feeling a little uh, healed because these are very hard things that we are talking about. So I want us to, I forgot to talk about, let, let's give an introduction of the report that you gave sort of like an overview. And maybe you can tie that in to, um, did you confront this uh, feeling when you were asked, talking to respondents? Did you confront that feeling of let's not go there, this is not important, why are we talking about emotions instead of development, Those, that kind of resistance. So give us an overview of, of, of the report and your experience uh, talking to respondents and then even you writing it, you know, did you did you get any new insights that you had not seen before you embarked on this research? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the the dilemma for Coalition for Peace in Africa and a couple of other people we were working with at the time was: is there something we missed? in the way we analyze conflicts in Kenya? Is there something we are missing fundamentally in the way we theorize about uh, issues of conflict and violence in Kenya? Uh, is there something we are missing about our practice um, as peace workers, uh, you know, as peace builders? So to some degree, this report was a kind of a listening project. We kind of wanted to understand ourselves, our practice, and our community. The assumption being that there's something we are missing. What could this be? And one of the dilemmas, of course, was, you know, uh, one of the things we did, uh, and many agencies also did, was to create what we called, uh, you know, local peace committees. Um, and basically this would be organic, you know, structures, locally rooted in the villages, building on the institution of eldership. Because we say it, when something happens in a community, people don't just sit back, they mm -hmm. do something. And of course, this was also coming from our own history of appreciating that when you look at the history of the Kenyan people uh, or African people in general, you'll realize that after every conflict or, or a major upheaval, uh, there was a peace process. And I think uh, Sultan Somji has done some wonderful work at the National Museum of Kenya on this. But these peace processes were never documented. So what you have is Africans fought each other, and then what? <laughs> and then in the United history, then they continued fighting. They waited for another war, then they fought and they fought. So that's kind of the image and the picture you get. And you're saying, no way, there were always peace processes. So this is what we, are, we were investing in. In any community, there's a peace process happening. 
How can we strengthen that? How can we support that? So when 2007 happened, you make phone calls to people you, you are, who have attended your trainings and they tell you, you know, Babu, man, we are, we are tired of this peace building thing. Uh, let, let's focus on something else. Or somebody tells you, Babu, what is happening here? I never saw it, I never imagined it. I do not even know how to, how to handle it. So this was basically what was driving our, 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 our study and our need to learn and our need to grow with the communities and the people that we had been working with for, for, for years. And then we realized in most cases, number one, how the whole idea of ethnicity, which for me, I prefer to call ethnicism, is yes. very instrumentalized. Um, and for me, this differentiation was, was made for me, uh, um, I think it was in 2005, uh, I visited Kigali, Rwanda, and there's a professor there who made that distinction. And he said, it's not about ethnicity. You know, really, you cannot say our ethnicity can be negative. And the example the professor used was to say, consider individuality and individualism. So it is the ism that we have issues with. But in our political lexicon, in our political language, it has been drummed so much that our sheer ethnic difference is a problem. <laughs> mm. You know, it's a political problem. And you hear it from the literature, even in peace and conflict studies, you hear it from the media, you hear it from really authoritative uh, forces. And that's what I realized. No, that's not the issue. And the way, the way people talked about it, whether I was in Kiambu, whether I was in Capitello Nyamumbi, whether I was in Kondele in Kisumu, the way people talked about it, the idea was not that, you know, uh, because we are different from those people, then that is the issue. It was a much more intelligent analysis about how that ethnicity then is packaged within our political culture, particularly during election. And then it, it becomes the defining issue. And believe you me, politicians do a thorough job uh, you know, about this. Then of course, Mualimu, the, the second thing that we confronted, and this came up from interview after interview, it is what we, we called, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a kind of an ethnic calendar of trauma. For me, it was really amazing that it didn't matter whether I interviewed a Luo in Nairobi or a Luo in Kisumu or a Luo in another part of the country. Or abroad, you mentioned that in the report. Yeah, as a people, we kind of, we share this narrative. And for me, it was really astounding because in the normal conversations in Kisumu, I never used to hear it. But you know, after the violence and the conversations and I'm seeking to understand, it comes up and it is shared. It is a shared narrative of victimhood. So when I went to parts of Rift Valley, a similar calendar of victimhood. And when I went to very, uh, various parts of central Kenya and parts of Nairobi, a similar kind of the narrative of victimhood. So when I was presenting the report for the first time, I was with my PowerPoint slides and I'm saying, you see these three communities, you know, this is how they define trauma and they see themselves as victims. And somebody told me, Babu, you need to go back to your field research because who really has suffered in this country more than the Maasai? And somebody else would have said, no, 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 no. Who has suffered in this country more than the Kamba? Somebody else will tell you, you know, you guys, you are speaking nonsense because you've never come to the coast. Do you know what you have endured? So you could see already how this narrative of victimhood is reproduced in very durable uh, systems at the community level, in structures, and even in political systems. 
And that is why when I was reading, when I was doing the data collection and the raw data is in, really reading Mahmoud Mamdani's When Victims Become Killers and Chimamanda Adichie's uh, Half of a Yellow Sun uh, and uh, Anzese Were's uh, Male Disempowerment was so important to help me distill the, all the raw data and try and put together kind of a coherent uh, story uh, you know, from what we have found out. So this for me was important. The last thing I want to mention, and there are many other things, Malimu, but this stood out really out, was the whole question of sexual and gender violence. Mm. And I kind of really sought to understand, and I'll give an example. In Kisumu, after the signing of the uh, we were calling what National Accord and Reconciliation Act. The level of violence, overt violence, violence in the street, the burning of tires went down. That one disappeared. But the rape, the sexual violence continued. And I needed to understand how this happens, why this happens. And of course, a lot of listening to the, to, to, to the respondents and also reading uh, the literature around that and making the connection of how it is so deliberate, the manner this violence is you know, orchestrated. The boys and the men know exactly what they are doing. And they know that the impact is not just on that one individual woman body, they know they know what that does to a people in the long term. They know what that does in what I can sort of say, deplete their, their, life, their life force. Uh, you know, the Maori I learned later have a very interesting expression. They call it the mana. They say each individual, individually and collectively, we all have what we call the mana, a kind of a spiritual force. And when certain things happen to us, or when we commit certain offenses, then we can actually deplete or reduce our level of manna. And when that happens, it then injures your relationship with fellow human beings uh, in the community, with the nature, with the ancestors, with the land, with your creator. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a very interesting and complex uh, you know, you, you know, concept of how people actually use then uh, rape or sexual violence as a way of depleting a people's manner. Um, so those are the three things I'd like to mention now, but of course there were, there were a couple of other important issues too. Hey, that, that one of the life force, when I read it, it just hit me because I also feel that, that there's a way in which violence against the woman's body has a deeper spiritual implication than just, you know, mere cutting up. I'm not saying that men's bodies are less valued, but there's a spiritual aspect that we are not able to, to recognize. I don't know if you, you would like to make that link between that and I think you also commented on it in the report. Our general uh, value for life as a, as, a, as a traumatized people, and maybe also link it to some of the insane violence we have witnessed against women, even up to today, like somebody being uh, hacked to death in the street and, and Kenyans, you know, not getting the import of it and, and instead looking for other political agendas to discuss. Yes. No, that's, that's really important. You know, the, you know, we can all read, especially my generation, we can all read about, you know, colonialism and the violence and so on and so forth. But not many of us have had the chance of being in a situation where a community or a people are negotiating that transition from a situation of uh, you know, violence, genocide and so on, 
and trying to find their way sort of to a better world and what would this world you know, look like. In 2016, when I lived in Parihaka, this small uh, Maori village in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Aotearoa the way, is the indigenous name of, of New Zealand, I sat in several meetings. And in these meetings, what the government of New Zealand was trying to do was to kind of have what they were calling a settlement with the different, they're calling it tribes. I don't like using the word uh, tribes for, <laughs> for many reasons. But they were trying to sort of have a kind of a, a settlement, a kind of a reconciliation process between the atrocities that the colonial government had committed uh, with, you know, in various, in various communities. So these conversations were, were really deep and they were both formal and informal. So I would sit in the marae, which is a kind of a sacred sitting space, but I would also kind of, you know, in the evening I would, I would, have, I would have a beer with a group of people and I would, I would be listening. This is the beauty of research. Uh, and I, I came to understand several things that were not very clear to me, even though, uh, you know, I was coming from a neo-colonial uh, state and I thought I knew, I knew these things, you know, I, I've read, I've read Ngugi Wa Thiongo, I've read Mainawa Kinyati and other writers who have documented all this. But this is, these are some of the things that I noticed that are relevant to your question. At that critical moment, when you are making this transition, the question usually is, how do you, do, you, do you deal with the past trauma? How do you make people accountable? Do we, do we kind of sacrifice justice so that we can have peace? Um, and in instances where these people will be living amongst you, they are not gone. They are there like in New Zealand. How do you deal with that? So I realized that it's such a difficult question, uh, Malimu, because the village would be divided fiercely. There are those who would say, look, we will not insult the history of our ancestors. They suffered. They were able to do this to bring us where we are here. And if the crown, as they called the government uh, of New Zealand at that time, if the crown cannot do this, we are not even engaging in that kind of uh, negotiation because it's not a negotiation really. This is a dialogue of where the powerful uh, speak twice. It's not a dialogue of you speak, I listen and, you know, and I speak. So that's usually a dilemma. And to be honest, I do not have a very nice answer to this question because I do know until today, the community there still struggles uh, with it. Then number two and connected to that is what is our vision of freedom? Because amongst the, amongst the Maori, their leaders were very clear about what it means to be a self-determining society. They were very clear and there were no compromises from what I saw, no compromises around that. But you are working within a coloniality of power. So what does self-determination, what does freedom mean within this coloniality of power? The tendency, unfortunately, is to mirror your oppressor. So the image you have of freedom is the image of our oppressor. I saw a little bit of that when I was living in the village. And when I read, of course, through my reading and experience, I could see a lot of that in many other parts of, 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 you know, you know, of the world. Nuruddin Farah, the Somali novelist, also speaks about it, that we oppressed are nothing but small little dictators. So <laughs> when we are fighting for freedom, the image we have is that of our oppressor. And I think also Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed talks about the oppressed forming what he calls an addition with their oppressor. So if you bring it back home, uh, our image of freedom is basically is to be, for those of us who survived Moi, is to be like Moi. 
And they say, this is the impact of the trauma because the impact of the trauma gives you, gives you this facade that for you to be a person, for you to be a man, for you to be a full human, you need to be like your oppressor. Some psychologists would even argue, uh, you know, I was reading some of the works of uh, the African-American psychologist, uh, Frances uh, says Wesling, and she also talks about that whole issue of trauma and the, when the oppressed are trying to cope with that, they are, then, they are then driven not by an alternative ideology or an alternative vision, but by the image of their very own oppressor. So, so to some degree, Mwalimu, we are all stuck in there individually and collectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at it this way. Most of the people in cabinet today in this country, Kenya, are people who are very well educated. I've interacted with some of them in my younger life. And I'm sure they know that Kenya deserves better. But I do not know what happened. I've never joined politics myself. I do not know what happened. When people get in there and then they get locked in that history of trauma and it means now to be free, to be human within a coloniality of power. You can even take the example of South Africa. When I lived in Zambia, one of the things I really appreciated was interacting a lot with people from all over Africa, particularly from Southern Africa. And therefore, sometimes I would just ask my class to try and help me understand the levels of violence in South Africa. And they made very interesting distinctions in most of their essays and the conversations in class. The African National Congress, led by Mandela and others, are really not fighting for freedom. They were fighting for inclusion. There is a difference. When you are fighting for inclusion, you're basically saying, I am happy to sit at my master's table. I am happy to be able to share in whatever that is going on at that table. And the coloniality of power does not, is not really opposed to that. But it gives up this false sense of freedom and healing and you know we are doing okay. But they say there were other movements in South Africa, for example, the Black Consciousness Movement led by Bani Pitiana, Steve Biko, uh, Mampela Rampele and others. And they said, we should not let the oppression make us subhuman. We should not let oppression do that. And therefore our first task in the liberation is our psychological healing. Oh. That is number one. Before you even talk about the material things, which coloniality of power dangles for you and gives you this sense of, you know, things are okay, your healing has happened. They said in the black consciousness, psychological liberation was the first task. And when we can mobilize, we must have an alternative vision, which is not about inclusion in our very system of oppression. So if I bring it back home, <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, I, I, I see people, you know, uh, condemning Raila Odinga or Vodiem and others. And Malimu, I say, you know what? Raila has been consistent. He's been fighting for inclusion. Go back and look at the pattern. It is us who are ascribing Raila all these other labels. No, 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 no. He's actually been very consistent. So when you look at even the founding fathers, and here I'm not including our founding mothers. When you look at the founding fathers, they fought for inclusion. Mm -hmm. they got, we got inclusion in 1963. So basically we, 
we've been talking about inclusion even in our politics. Mm. Therefore, the ANC led by Mandela was fighting for inclusion. And in 1994, they were included. If you read what they call the sunset clauses, they actually show you all the compromises the ANC made, even to do with the land and everything else. In the same way, you can use the same lenses to read the BPI and you will see the politics of inclusion. Mm. So we are not being moved by an alternative vision. No, we are stuck in there. And the trauma gets us stuck there. <sighs> That's a lot to take. Maybe, you know, we, we've talked about the coloniality of power, but now yes. I want us to shift a little bit to the coloniality of the academy. And what is your sense of the way um, psych, the, the disciplines of psych, psychiatry and psychology, wh what is your sense of why they are so ineffective in dealing with the underlying trauma that we have? Because you mentioned it in the, in the report, but I would like you to just pull it apart a little bit for the people who are listening. Okay. Um, I think nowadays we all hear about mental health. I mean, it's become the, <laughs> it's become a big thing. And I think that conversation for me, Malimu, is important. But also it's important to recognize the limits of how the academy approaches issues of healing. Um, we know, we know of communities. I come from a family where uh, people had issues about uh, whether you want to call it mental health or instability and so on and so forth. And there's a slight, there's a very different, not slightly, there's a very different way I saw my grandmother and my grandparents, you know, approach that. The understanding even, the diagnosis of what is it actually that's, that's really happening to this individual. So in the analysis, the community included itself, at least in Ranga where I grew up, in explaining why so-and-so was experiencing this. But from what I've read, what I've studied in, uh, in psychiatry, the tendency, and in psychology, the tendency to individualize things and say, um, okay, let's put it this way. The tendency to fail to connect the health of an individual to what is happening around them in terms of their politics, justice, and so on and so forth. For me, it's, it's a fundamental failure. I don't know why the academy does that, but again, that's a, a rhetorical question. Because as a colonial institution, then the, the regimes of the way we approach research, the way we approach uh, teaching, and so on and so forth, will be, influenced, uh, will be influenced by that. I mean, I see it even in peace and conflict studies where conflicts are only seen sometimes as, you know, it's a matter of communication between two individuals, you know, it's a matter of anger management and so on and so forth. And so, no, no, but you need to ask, where is this anger and everything else, you know, coming from and so on? How is it connected to our own institutions of justice and so on? So for example, as soon as Franz Fanon makes that connection, the whole conversation about psychiatry changes. As soon as Francis uh, Westling uh, uh, makes that connection between psychiatry issues, the psychiatrist, with the issues of justice around people, then the conversation changes. And sometimes I look back and I ask myself, is it a mere coincidence that most of the people who are at the forefront of radical social change were also either medical doctors or psychologists or, and psychiatrists. So you can say Franz Fanon, you can talk of Francis Wesling, you can talk of uh, in the Philippines, uh, you can talk of uh, Enrico Virgilio, uh, you, we can talk of Che Guevara, uh, we can talk of Steve Biko and Mampela Rampele, because as soon as these thinkers and practitioners made that connection, between the mental health or the psychiatric challenge an individual was facing with what was happening in the community and in the society, then we have an entirely different conversation. 
So even the report, the report that came out uh, on mental health by the task force, um, I think a couple of months ago, it's, it's an important step. Uh, but at the same time, they only mention those connections here and there. And as soon as you kind of mention it, you know, here and there, then the analysis then gets lost. Then your recommendation then also get lost because you got it wrong at the you know, analysis stage. So for me, my argument has always been, and uh, Malidome Some Price in, from Burkina Faso has done wonderful work around this. The traditions on how we diagnose and approach healing. We need to, I don't know, I don't like using the word re re revitalize a lot, but I think it comes closest to it. They are there. And they're even pra being practiced until today. Um, it's only that we are products of this colonial institution and uh, for a very long time, we've not amplified that through our research, through our own practices, but they're there. And, and in fact, I saw a tweet from the official BBI handle. They were saying that what needs to be rectified with the police is their mental health. That's what they said. And that's, that's part of it. It's part of it. It's a small part, but hey, uh, we also need to, to really dig deep on how trauma is reproduced in institutions, mm -hmm. how trauma is reproduced in individual behavior. A lot of work and a lot of analysis needs to happen there, Malimu. Uh, we've been trying, I mean, but uh, so much still needs to be done. So um, maybe you can, um, you know, elaborate on that because there's a mention of structural violence in yes. the report. So could you elaborate on what that is and maybe help Kenyans see how trauma is, is replicated in our daily lives and our relationships? Yes. Uh, actually, the, the person credited with developing that model is the Norwegian Johan. Uh, he talks about the connection between cultural violence, structural violence, and direct violence. Although from my own study, uh, you know, there are many other authors like Marimba Ani uh, in her book, uh, Yurugu. She also talks about cultural violence and makes it very specific to the experiences of black people uh, world over. So if you're to come back to this model, it's a very basic and simple argument. Johan Galtung says, when you see violence, which is direct, basically mob injustice, um, people fighting in the streets, uh, uh, skirmishes at a matatu stage, he says, it's important, of course, to capture that, but that should not be the end of the story. That as peace workers, we need to ask ourselves, how is that direct violence connected to the institutions and structures we have built over years or now we organize our lives. So you begin asking those two people who are fighting, where are they positioned in this structure and system that we are talking about? Because it is this structure that determine who gets what, who has what power, who gets to decide this and, and so on and so forth. Then below the structural violence, we have then cultural violence. Now, according to Johan Galtung, he says, this is, this is the, the violence of people like you and me, Mwalimu, because we generate ideas. We give people uh, frames of meaning and reference in this life. It is the violence that comes from the church because there is a certain belief system. So to give a very simple example, to go back to the issue again about gender violence, if we build a society where a majority of us, both women and men believe that women are second class citizens, then consciously or unconsciously, we shall build structures and systems that reflect that belief. And therefore you make domestic violence or gender-based violence almost inevitable. A boy or a man who grows up in this system with these belief systems that say women are second class citizens and so on, it's okay to beat up a woman and so on and so forth. 
they actually are raised within a structure and a system, whether it is within the house or in the society, that actually enables their behavior of violence against the other gender. So that, for example, if you beat up your wife as a man and you go to a typical police station, a man is almost assured that he will kind of get an endorsement or support. Because the officers might most likely say, Kwani, eh? if a woman goes to complain, the police will say, Kwani ulifanya, ulifanya buwanako nini? Eh? Ulifanya buwanako nini do akafanya hivi? Eh? Or if you keep on protesting about your rights and so on and so forth, they'll tell you, unajua mama wao nonekana umemea pende? So you find that cultural violence within the police station and the structures that enable it are right there. And therefore you make direct violence inevitable. If you make it more relevant for politics, you see it there. The artists, the politicians, maybe they're even late uh, before 2022, we will hear the songs. They contain certain messages. Johan Galtung will say that's the cultural violence. And it can be very subtle, you know, these people are like this, and these people are like this. When I was in Kisumu, I had songs sung by Lua musicians talking about other people. And they paint, they tap onto this, uh, what can I call it? The anger and a certain belief system and certain stereotypes and so on and so forth. Then they find that there is a structure, a political structure and system that enables that kind of behavior. So every politician knows they can go and insult everybody the way they want, use all the, stereo, the tribal, quote unquote, stereotypes. And you know what they do? Their tactic is very simple. They apologize. <laughs> when they are called out, they apologize. But you know what? The message has already been passed. Or they know that in our, in our structure and system, there is, there is an institution called NCIC the National Cohesion and Integration Commission, right? They know very well they're gonna be called there. Somebody will interview them. Nobody will prosecute. So there is a system and a structure that enables these kinds of behaviors from politicians. Therefore you make violence almost inevitable. Yeah. And especially by the way, when you tie anything to land, this is what also we learned from our research with Coalition for Peace in Africa. As soon as you tie things to land, then you, it goes very deep. Actually, Malima should say more about this. This is my own hypothesis. Yes, please, please.